I am going to ask everybody within this room if they are not speaking or planning to speak, if they can mute themselves. Um, we've got a really tight schedule. We've got a lot of really great content and speakers to hear from. Um, and so we would like to respect everybody's time by allowing everybody to be able to listen, learn, and share their experiences. So with that, it is now 6.04, and I'd like to um, pass the program on to um, Reverend Weston Matthews. He is the pastor from the um, Grace, the Plains Episcopal, Episcopal Church and director of Interfaith Alliance for Climate Justice. And, um, and he will open our program and lead us in an invocation. Um, Pastor Weston, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Karen, and thank all of us and to everybody who's gathered here. Uh, before I begin an invocation for us all, I'd just like to name uh, George Floyd and in Richmond, Marcus David Peters, and for us to pause and take a moment of racism and of gun violence and of violence. So let's just take a few moments to gather ourselves. And I invite you, if you wish, to simply close your eyes. Almighty God, giver of all good things, we thank you for the natural majesty and wealth and our nation. They restore us, though we often destroy them. Heal us. We thank you for the great resources of our commonwealth and nation. They make us rich, though we often exploit them. We thank you for the people who have made this country their models for us, though we often fall short of them inspire us. We thank you for the torch of liberty, which has been lit in this land. It draws people from every nation, every language, every race, though we have often hidden from its light. We thank you for the faith we have inherited and all its rich diversity and variety. It sustains our common life, though we have been faithless again and again. Renew us. Help us, God, to finish the good work Strengthen our efforts for environmental justice to blot out ignorance and prejudice, and to abolish poverty and racism. And hasten the day when all our people with many voices, united in one chorus, will glorify your name, our creator. Amen. I'll turn it back over to Karen. Thank you all very much and God bless you. God be with you. Thank you, Pastor Matthews, for those very inspiring and inspirational words. Um, it is some trying times that we are in today, and it's up to us to work together to make a solution and to bring everybody into an equitable and just uh, world. Um, I, it is um, my absolute and utter honor and pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker here tonight. Um, uh, I, I, I just don't have the words to say what an ally he has been in the fight for environmental justice as we fight um, for um, transition into a clean energy and fight our fight against the pipeline. Um, and so with that, I'd like to pass the mic on to our amazing ally and supporter and um, mentor and guider, William Parber III. Thank you so much for being with us here today. Thank you, Karen, and thank you, and good evening to um, Virginia family. Um, it is so good to be on with each of you uh, today. You know, this week has really weighed on me, but, you know, joining you all, joining this work um, has served as a real pick-me-up, you know, in these moments. Um, you know, these days have weighed on me, um, you know, being transparent, just like they weighed on many of you. Um, you know, and we are in some dark times and some challenging times, but I think, you know, in the midst of these challenging times, uh, are where the true opportunities often lie. Um, you know, what has helped me is to think about so many, right, in these moments who have found themselves in dark times and yet still 
have found a way, have found the energy, have committed to bringing light. You know, I think about W.E.B. Du Bois, who in 1919, after World War I, talked about uh, this notion of soldiers of democracy, right? And said that despite all the ills of our nation at the time, and you can imagine what was going on in 1919, nonetheless, it was our nation and it was on us to redeem it. And it would be foolish to think that we would fight for democracy and fight against racial arrogance globally and not return to America and to do the same. You know, I think about Frederick Douglass, who after the Dred Scott decision, and if there was ever a time when any movement should have been deflated, should have been dejected, should have given up, it should have been after the Dred Scott decision. But nonetheless, Frederick Douglass, he went through a moment of depression, but he came back and he said, oppression organized as ours is, injustice organized as ours is, will always appear invincible up to the very hour of his fall. That's how it is and that's how it always will be. You know, I think about Coretta Scott King who said that freedom, justice and equality, all of these tenets that we hold dear, they are never really won, but they must be fought for in every generation. Uh, and in this moment, in our generation, it is our time to fight. You know, and then I think about so many who when we talk about this system of white supremacy and be very clear, we are against a system we're fighting a system. So many, I think about so many who have joined and stood against it. You know, black, white, indigenous, brown, Asian. Don't let anyone think, you know, make you think that the resistance to white supremacy has only been black against white. It has been a great uh, rainbow of people. And a part of our legacy as a country has been the forces that have always tried, tried to divide us, you know, and though powerful and though entrenched and though codified in law, there have been a resistance to those forces that have always risen with each generation. So I'm glad to be on with you all tonight. Um, I hope to be brief um, and just wanna hop in here. You know, in 1967, Dr. King gave a speech uh, entitled Beyond Vietnam, where he said a time to break silence. Uh, it was in this speech, which he first articulated this idea, this concept of a fierce urgency of now. The idea that there is such a thing as actually being too late. Uh, he urged the nation to recognize that this was no time for apathy or complacency, but instead was a time for vigorous and positive action. He said these words in 1967. 53 years later, 2020, Dr. King's words ring true with renewed vigor, our fierce urgency of now. You know, for every young person here imbued with the courage to recognize their future is in the balance when we talk about the environmental crisis, talk about the climate crisis. There is a fierce urgency of now. For every elder burdened with doubt of, have I done enough to prevent this crisis? There is a fierce urgency of now. For every community, frontline, poor, black, indigenous, coastal, rural, whose very existence rests in the balance of what we do to solve this crisis, there is a fierce urgency of now. And for each of us who recognize that the climate crisis has been the culmination of all the forms of oppression we have cultivated over the years and how we address it will determine our ability to move forward, there is a fierce urgency of now. And today we still have a choice. Right now we still have a choice. We can choose indecision and complacency and destruction, or we can choose bold action ambitious action and a new way forward towards a bright future. So which one shall we choose? You know, which one shall we choose? That answer is on us. And if we say we choose our future, then how do we get there? Well, I think there are three steps. You know, first, I think we must re recognize the full extent of the crises that we face. When we talk about the climate crisis, I know I'm preaching to the choir but just want to briefly go into this. You know, the UN IPCC report has listed a window of less than a decade, less than 10 years, for us to undertake sweeping policy in order to limit global warming to 1.5 degrees above pre-industrial levels. Right now, in the terms of the climate crisis, we know that we're spewing 150 mil 152 million tons of man-made global warming pollution into our atmosphere every 24 hours right now. We know that right now, CO2 is being released into the atmosphere 
faster than any time in the last 66 million years right now. We know that right now, 19 of the 20 hottest years on record have occurred since 2001. We know that Arctic Circle temperatures just two weeks ago climbed to nearly 80 degrees. We know that we've seen the splitting of the polar vortex in February uh, 2018 and in January 2019, which we of course knows intensifies weather conditions. You know, just go and look up uh, the North American winter storm of January 2019. We know that ocean temperatures have reached record highs. We know that, that this slows down circulation, changes salinity, and it impacts biodiversity. We know that increased extreme weather events, increased frequency and intensity of hurricanes are, are occurring, increased frequency and intensity of far, forest fires and flooding on the climate issue. So we know the urgency of the climate issue. We also know on the climate issue that this issue intersects with our present poverty crisis. We talk a lot about the present pandemic, but did you know that before COVID-19, so before COVID-19, we know that nearly 700 people were dying in the United States every day from poverty and inequality. And yet there was little to no mention of poverty and the extreme poor in our federal poly policy response to this pandemic. We know that right now 140 million people nearly half of this nation's populace lives in situations where they are poor or one life emergency from being poor. 60 million low wage workers in the country, many of whom were deemed essential in the face of this pandemic, who were forced to choose between, you know, working to put food on the table or, 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 or you know, forced to face a vicious pandemic. They do not have paid family leave or paid sick leave. We know 10 million new unemployment claims in March 2020 alone, with the Federal Reserve estimating 47 million claims by summer's end. Between 8 to 11 million people homeless or on the verge of being homeless. So these are the situations. This is the context. This is the urgency in which we find ourselves. And on top of this, we know that this current presidential administration has demonstrated more interest in behaving as an autocrat than addressing these urgent issues, these urgent crises facing the American people. More interest in working to suppress the vote, to sow division, to brutalize the American people than address the urgencies of our time. So make no mistake, we are in a full blown crisis. But now that we fully face what we are up against, I think the second step is that we need to think through strategic policy that matches the scale of the crises that we face. You know, again, on this topic, on this concept of Dr. King's activism and how it informs us today, from 1967 to 68, in a number of speeches, Dr. King noted the three evils of racism, militarism, and poverty. We've expanded that in the renewed Poor People's Campaign to include ecological devastation, recognizing the crisis of this present moment. We've included the distorted moral narrative of Christian nationalism that prevents us from really leaning into the morality that compels us to address these issues with urgency. Um, but in, in the time when Dr. King first introduced these three ills, he juxtaposed the gains of the civil rights movement with these issues by saying that up to the point, the issues of race at the time, specifically that of segregation and voting rights had not cost the nation anything in identifying the interplay of racism, militarism, and poverty, he articulated that solving segregation and expanding voting rights were issues that did not cost the nation anything. If anything, they actually boosted the economy. But in his articulation of the evils of racism, militarism, and poverty, he said that these were issues critical to the nation's psyche that would not and could not be addressed without requiring billions of dollars, but that were necessary in order to secure, truly secure an equitable society. And we see that in the modern issues of the climate crisis. We see that in our modern issues of poverty. We see that in our modern issues of everything from universal health care uh, 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 to a living wage. These are issues that will cost the nation something. And we need to really wrestle with that. And a lot of times the pushback that we hear when we begin talking about policies that will cost a nation something, they talk about the expense 
of solving the issue, right? They talk about the expense of solving the climate issue, the expense of solving poverty, the expense of granting universal health care. Well, in this moment, in this pandemic moment, we saw that our government was able to mobilize nearly $5.5 trillion with little to no outcry in the name of responding to COVID. And much of that did not get to the right people, the poor people, frontline communities, people who were suffering in the first place. So when we talk about the economic cost of these crises, two pieces, the money is there. That's not an issue, it's a matter of political will. We can find the money. And when we talk about the cost, we should not look at the cost to solve, but we should look at the cost of not solving. When we talk about the climate crisis, for example, in the last two years alone, uh, the expense has been $653 billion, not including the human cost of suffering and lives lost. How sustainable is that? We talk about the cost of poverty. How sustainable is it for a nation to have nearly half of its populace live in extreme poverty? It's not sustainable. It's not sustainable. It's not sustainable. So we must assess these situations from the cost of not solving these issues. And finally, I would say uh, step three is we must build a movement that represents all of us. You know, as we see these moments of social disruption, it's important to recognize that we are all called. For anyone who ever thought you what you might do in the civil rights movement, if, if given the chance, this is your time. For anyone who ever wondered what you might do in the movement for abolition, this is your time. Anyone who ever wondered what they might do in the face of global urgency, this is your time. Recognize that unborn generations are watching to see what we will do with this, our moment in history. Wrong won't stop. It won't stop. It's the nature of wrong to constantly rise against progress and try to stifle creative hope into permanent despair. But we have been given this moment to exemplify all of those tenets we have believed in. Every notion of righteousness and justice, of fairness and equality, of diligence, of action, of hope and humanity becomes real now in this moment but only, but only if we choose to act in that way. Only if we choose to be those forces of light. Only if we choose to be those agents of change. We are our own best hope and it is our, our action that we prove we are worthy to have been those who claim that hope at all. You know, there is actually a dichotomy, um, you know, that exists in this moment and there are sides to choose, but it's not as simple as black versus white or us versus them. The dichotomy that exists in this moment is those who choose to see the existing fracture points, to see these crises and social disparity and maintain and benefit from them versus those of us who see the same fracture points and perhaps imperfectly choose to work and close the gaps. The narrative we craft will be crucial to what we can accomplish. And the practical matter is that there is hope, right? There is hope and, and not just in, in ourselves and what we are called to in this moment, but we know that we have the tools to do this and to power our lives without destroying the planet. We know that we can leave fossil fuels behind and make possible a just transition to clean energy. And by doing that, we can avoid the worst of the climate crisis and give all peoples and countries a chance at a healthy future. We know that right now the earth receives more energy from the sun every hour than humanity uses in a year globally. We know wind could supply the world's electricity needs 40 times over. We're seeing advances in photovoltaic technology and battery storage technology that makes this even more viable. And we can afford this. We know that already renewables are the cheapest form of new electricity generation for over two thirds of the planet and costs keep falling. And best of all, we know that we can make this just transition to clean energy that gets toxic fossil fuels out of our neighborhoods and creates green careers with the future in communities from Atlanta to Appalachia and beyond. So when we stand up and stand together, systems can change. When we stand up and stand together, this movement can change. And when we stand up and stand together, we can change this country, this world, and history tells us that when this happens, we win. So I say for together, thank you for letting me join you all. And I'm excited to continue to stand with you all as we roll this out, work out in Virginia, in North Carolina, in the South, because as the South goes, so goes the nation. Thank you all. 
Thank you so much, William. Those were uh, amazing words. And it, it, it goes to show why you have been such a strong ally and supporter in everything that we're doing here in Virginia. And, and, and what we're doing here is going to make such a, a change throughout the land. So uh, I appreciate you joining us and staying with, uh, staying with us through the program. Um, now to move on to the second part of the program, we've got uh, two speakers um, lined up to um, help pull everything that we're doing here today um, for the Green New Deal Virginia in context. But before I introduce um, our two speakers, um, I just wanted to give some background information for those that are new here with us today um, and do not have a lot of information about the Green New Deal. Um, the Green New Deal was started in 2019. It was brought down to Virginia by delegates um, Sam Razul and Elizabeth Guzman um, as an opportunity for Virginians to identify ways to combat the two biggest crises that we are experiencing today, which is um, climate change and inequities. And, um, you know, the events that um, um, Pastor Matthews and um, William Barber III have discussed um, shows how, how crucial and how um, urgent um, addressing these two um, um, crises in Virginia and throughout the land is. Um, and it's put in a bigger urgency and importance on the work that we're doing here today and throughout um, the coming days. Um, and so it was part of the legislative session um, and it, with amazing um, um, foresight, both Delegate Razul and Guzman pulled it from the legislative packet and said, you know, we really need to identify what, what are the issues that are um, plaguing uh, Virginians. And, so we decided to do some community mobilization efforts and reaching out to everyone to finding out what is it that are creating the barriers that are preventing everybody from being able to tra um, transition to a clean economy equitably. Um, and this is, um, and so we've been reaching out to um, uh, different community organizations. Um, the Green New Deal um, Virginia Coalition is comprised of um, 70 or 80 different coalition members and some that may not um, and, and just some individuals that are very passionate about um, righting the wrongs of the past and right, uh, identifying solutions for the future. And, um, and so we've been working um, to um, 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 I, you know, come up with policy to combat these, um, the, these issues. And Lee Williams, who is also on the webinar, um, the co-director with the Green New Deal, She'll be going um, into more detail about um, how we came up with our policy, our 2021 um, packet, and um, give us some more instructions on how we can help, can, how we can work together to um, um, identify solutions that we can move forward with um, um, today. Um, so, for, so first up would be um, um, Kendall Crawford, who is um, the Director of Interfaith Power and Light. Um, she is a member of the Virginia Environmental Justice Collaborative and a board member of the Virginia um, Conservation Network. And she'll be followed by Michael Carter, who is with the um, Virginia Collaborative Extension um, Small Farm Resource Center and is um, an actual um, um, heritage farmer here in Virginia. So um, with that, I would like to start with you, Kendall. Let America be America again. Let it be the dream it used to be. Let it be the pioneer on the plane seeking a home where he himself is free. America never was America to me. Let America be the dream the dreamers dreamed. Let it be that great strong land of love where never kings connive nor tyrants scheme that any man be crushed by one above. It never was America to me. Oh, let my land be a land where liberty is crowned with no false patriotic wreath, but opportunity is real and life is free. Equality is in the air we breathe. There's never been equality for me, nor freedom in this homeland of the free. Say, who are you that mumbles in the dark? And who are you that draws your veil across the stars? I am the poor white, fooled and pushed apart. I am the Negro bearing slavery scars. I am the red man driven from the land. I am the immigrant clutching the hope I seek. 
and finding only the same old stupid plan of dog eat dog of mighty crush the weak. Oh, I'm the man who sailed those early seas in search of what I meant to be my home. For I'm the one who left dark Ireland's shore and Poland's plain and England's grassy lea and torn from black Africa's strand I came to build a homeland of the free. The free? Who said the free? Not me, surely not me. The millions on relief today, the millions shot down when we strike, the millions who have nothing for our pay, for all the dreams we've dreamed and all the songs we've sung and all the hopes we've held and all the flags we've hung, the millions who have nothing for our pay except the dream that's almost dead today. Oh, let America be America again, the land that never has been yet and yet must be, the land where every man is free, the land that's mine, the poor man's, Indians, Negroes, me. Who made America? Whose sweat and blood? Whose faith and pain? Whose hand at the foundry? Whose plow in the rain? Must bring back our mighty dream again. Sure, call me an ugly name you choose. The steel of freedom does not stain. From those who live like leeches on the people's lives, we must take back our land again. America. Oh, yes, I say it plain. America never was America to me. And yet I swear this oath. America will be. Out of the rack and ruin of our gangster death, the rape and rot of graft and stealth and lies, we the people must redeem the land, the mines, the plants, the rivers, the mountains, and the endless plain. All, all the stretch of these great green states and make America again. I was asked to share with you the connections between the Green New Deal and COVID-19. So I decided to share an excerpt of one of my favorite poems by Langston Hughes because it expresses beautifully the contradictions on which this country was founded, the denial of justice, the denial of equality to the powerless throughout history, and yet it does so in a way that lights a candle to keep hope alive for us to stay encouraged and to keep moving forward in the struggle. Whether we are talking police brutality, economic injustice, poverty, voting rights, the disproportionate deaths we are seeing from COVID-19 in communities of color, especially among Black, Latinx, and Indigenous people, whether we're talking about the higher levels of pollution in neighborhoods of the poor, or climate apartheid, all of these issues have the same root. They are all connected. This year has been something that I have never experienced anything like it before in my life. The sickness, death, failure of leadership, trauma, despair, anger. But in the midst of all this, uh, we must not forget the moments of hope this year, like the signing of the Virginia Environmental Justice Act which not only makes it the policy of the Commonwealth to promote environmental justice, but also to ensure that it is carried out. That was a historic moment for the state of Virginia. Still, we have a long way to go. Um, as I close, I want to remind you of the common roots of our struggles. And I want to remind you to hold on to one another as we move forward creating beloved community as that is the only way we will ever get to justice together. Thank you. Thank you, Kendall. Um, uh, thank you so much. And um, thank you for your words in the beginning. That was very powerful. You're, you're up. Thank you, Michael. Thanks for logging back on. <laughs> no problem. Um, as we you know, return back to our new normal, you have to understand what a new normal is for most African Americans. It's what we're seeing in the streets, what we saw in Minnesota, what we've seen for many generations. The devaluing of African life, where there's actually more value for animals, more value for being able to get a haircut than it is for African life. Yeah. And I put this in context because this is the greatest issue that America has to solve, is the value gap. The value gap is the greatest issue that farmers have to deal with. 
Um, and my family's been here in America since at least 1745. 11 generations of my family has farmed the lands of Virginia. Six of those generations at minimum were in Indian slave period, where we worked against our will, when they worked against their will uh, to make this country what it is today. And this value tax is, is one that we have to really grapple with, the value gap, how we see our food, how much do you spend on your food? Who grows your food? Uh, many individuals kind of ask me on a regular basis, what can I do to you know, increase equity in the food system? And the biggest thing that you can do is support a black farmer, support a local and small farmer, support black businesses, put your grant monies into a black bank to support the community at large. You know, it's not difficult, but what's difficult is really putting your assets where your mouth is. You know, in the same level of determination, of grit, of fight that it took to put the African in this country, in this situation for the last 400 years, is gonna, the same type of tenacity in turning that around is the only way we're gonna get back to having some level of equity and equality. And I equate it very much to, I mean, I'm pretty sure most of us have played the game Monopoly. None of us, I'm sure, have ever tried to play the game Monopoly not starting at the same time as everybody else. So if you played the game Monopoly and those individuals who are playing with you get a chance to go around the board once, twice, six times, eight times, 10 times, 400 times before you get a chance to go around that board, you're gonna be at a serious disadvantage when you're playing that game. No matter what property you're landing on, most likely you're gonna to have to pay. And that's the situation the black farmer has found themselves in. That we're behind the eight ball. And that no matter how many times we've tried to level the playing field, just play within our own community, it's always worked against us in terms of discrimination from federal agencies like the USDA. In terms of discrimination in our own communities, where our own people are not buying our food from us because there's, a, there's not a demand for that type of food. It's not as convenient as canned glory greens. It's not as convenient as Cheetos and chips. We have to make some serious inquiries into ourselves about how much value we put on ourselves and the, what we consume in terms of our food, in terms of our environment. As I'm listening about the environmental justice platform, justice is a form of restitution. But again, without an equaling or leveling of the playing field, without putting your assets where your mouth is, without making sure that when you pass on that you leave an inheritance, not to your offspring, but to those who've been disenfranchised for a very long period of time, to give them a better chance, a better opportunity. We have an obligation to support our farmers all over the state, our small farmers, our local farmers, and we have an even greater obligation to support our black farmers. You know, in my lifetime, since 1978, we've had from 5,000 black farmers, we're now down to 1,100. In that same time period, the number of other farmers have increased dramatically. So out of all the farmers in the state, and it's approximately 45,000 farmers in the state, of that approximately 43,500 are considered to be small farmers, which produce produce or livestock less than $300,000 on their farm. Of those individuals, again, only 1,100 of those 43,000 are black farmers. And considering the indigenous people of this land and the Africans brought here were the original farmers, we're at the point now where black farmers are virtually extinct. And if you want to save the, you know, America, if you want to receive, or work toward equity, you have to invest in our farmers. You have to invest in all farmers, but especially the black ones, because we are catching it from every end possible. We don't get the type of support that's needed in terms of from governments. Uh, we generally have to share the pot with a whole bunch of other individuals who may not have had the same level of discrimination that we have had. So, I'd like to encourage all of us to support our farmers, get to know your farmer, and put your money, your assets, your property, where your mouth is. But that's the only way we're gonna make this equitable and right again. Thank you, Michael. Um, it, it's, it's very important, and I think with, um, you know, what you said with the COVID pandemic, it, it, it shows how important it is for us to have 
localized systems and, um, and, and, and you know, supporting our local farmers is so important because whenever there is an event as large as COVID-19, we really re relied on our local farmers to um, um, provide us with the, our, our nutrients and our, our, our high valued um, uh, of food. So um, support our farmers. I, I, I thank you for being here with us today. And I know how busy you are, so I appreciate you taking the time out. Um, so before I open um, the panel for questions and answer, I just wanted to talk very briefly about um, another one of the um, big issues that Green New Deal Virginia is, um, um, is, is planning to work with our communities to help solve, and that's equity in transportation. Um, the Clean Car um, Task Force and a lot of other reports have identified that African um, African American communities and communities of color are more li more imp more likely to be located and impacted by near roadway um, air pollution. Meaning, um, these communities are located by your highly heavily traveled um, um, roadways, such as highways that have um, um, diesel fuel um, emitting um, um, trucks and, and freight um, um, infrastructure, as well as um, traffic congestion. And children are more than likely to experience uh, near roadway pollution effects that impacts their um, academic achievements. And, 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 and so while, so the uh, Union of Concerned Scientists also reported that while African American communities and communities of color are most impacted by near roadway pollution, um, these communities are all least likely to own a vehicle, and um, most they rely most on um, public transportation. Um, as we know, uh, greenhouse uh, transportation, the transportation sector is the highest contributor of greenhouse gas emission here in Virginia at 46%. So it's very crucial that we fi uh, figure out a way now how to lower uh, uh, and minimize greenhouse gas emissions as well as the impacts associated with that. And one of the ways that we can do that is to make sure as we transition over to clean energy that our public transportation um, and our transit and our roadways and all of those decisions um, impacting those resources are done in an equitable manner. And so one of the main approaches that it can, um, and on how it can be done to, uh, to um, um, achieve those goals is our, um, and our approach to bettering our transportation system um, should move us away from a system that is extractive um, in terms of um, the, the production of how we produce fossil, our energy from fossil fuel um, how we consume, um, the high cost of owning a car and insurance, it, it makes it um, impossible for some families and individuals to be able to even own a, a vehicle, um, as well as oppressive. Um, lack of transportation hinders socioeconomic advancement of individuals and communities by um, giving them less opportunities to um, um, have access to quality education, uh, medical services, as well as um, quality jobs. And so we should be, when we think about our transportation solutions, we should be moving towards resiliency, um, regenerative um, uh, prop, uh, projects, um, and demand that what we have are going to have equitable outcomes. And so this transition process must place race, gender, and um, in class at the center of the solution equations um, to make them just transitions. And that can be achieved by um, developing improvements which targets improving access in low income communities and communities of color um, by preserving and improving housing affordability, which is very important and supporting and creating quality of life benefits, high quality employment, and um, healthier environments through our transportation systems. Okay, so I'm gonna ask a question while I'm looking through here, um, and I'm gonna um, pose it, uh, give this question to everyone here um, today. 
So the Green New Deal looks at many different things. We look at air, land, water, transportation, agriculture. We've heard about the overall environmental justice. We've, we've, sp we've spoken about um, the COVID-19 and what we're seeing on a national level with the platform on how um, racism and oppression is, is on the spotlight. Um, what is your number one or number two um, goals that you would like to see come out of what these upheavals are doing? Um, because I'd like to think that in the dark there will be light. So what are the things that you hope will come out of these tragic events? And since your video is on, Kendall, um, I'll start with you. <laughs> Oh because no, I cut my video off. <laughs> <laughs> you forgot to cut it off. Oh, um, that is such a good question, Karen. Um, man, over the over the past, you know, week or so, I've been um yeah, I've been, you know, just watching watching the news, um, and you know, kind of also going back into black history and kind of doing some some readings that, that which you know kind of explains the, the poem that I shared but um you know what I really would love to see um you know obviously you know if we're if we're talking about you know police brutality you know, obviously some you know national standards um you know holding people accountable um as to how they're treating, you know, fellow human beings, no matter what race they are. Um, but, you know, kind of overall and for the, the, the long term, um, you know, I really want to see um, concrete policy platforms in a slew of areas, um, you know, not, not even just, you know, environmental, you know, as you already mentioned, Karen, but, you know, education, um, you know, just runs, runs the gambit. Um, you know, economic justice, uh, just because I think it's, it's time, you know, it's time, you know, last year, last year we commemorated 400 years of, uh, since the arrival of Africans here, um, and it's just, it's just past time, it's past time. So what I'm hoping to see is a concrete policy platform, um, and I'm hoping to see, um, you know, concrete and sustained action um, you know, across the country. Um, sorry, this my spot. My uh, it's kind of all over the place. But I'm really hoping that this will be the start of a renewed push towards, you know, policy and, you know, holding our our elected officials accountable for all that they have not been doing. Um, sorry, <laughs> my my brain is a little scattered. <laughs> I'll just end it there. Yeah, I, I think that's also indicative of all the things that have to happen, you know. So thank you for for your response. Um, is there um, anyone else on the panel that would like to ask that, that question, um, answer that question? Can you say the question again? I'm sorry. <laughs> yes, um, you know, in, 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 in faced with what, what we're going through now with COVID-19, um, and um, um, with COVID-19 and the tragedy that we're seeing now um, with, uh, you know, the murder of George Floyd and all of the protest against racism that's going across the country, actually across the globe. Um, what, you know, if you were to be able to pick one coal that you would like to see out that comes, the light that comes out of this darkness, um, what would it be? And then I'll have you answer that question and then I'm going to move to the chat box after you're done with that, Michael. Very good. Yeah. Again, I mean, just going back to what I stated earlier, is, is a change in our values, what we spend our money on, what we spend our time doing, and how we see life on this planet. Uh, life is precious, whether it be from the bacteria, the fungus, the protozoa, the nematodes of the soil, on up to, you know, humans. Mm -hmm. They all serve a role, and I think our education, unfortunately, has made us only deem human life as valuable. This, this is why we have to have an environmental justice summit, because we don't see the value of everything in our, in our environment as being valuable. So once we can start shifting our eyes and our vision and our ears 
to that which is living, breathing, respirating, you know, that's providing for us. And in turn, we're providing for them. We can have a greater way of moving forward. Because right now, the, the biggest virus that we're still experiencing is systemic racism and capitalism. And they go hand in hand. And these two forces create this, 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 this facade of race. When I lived in West Africa and Ghana, I would walk the streets on a regular basis. And I'd be the only black man walking the streets. Made it they, they never saw me as black. Or well, they saw me as black, but they were not black. They were Fonte. They were Khan. They were Ashanti. They were Bono. They were Airway. Their identity was not based upon the color of their skin, but on their rich cultural history and traditions. Many of us have been robbed of that. Would it be your European, Asian, African? You've been robbed of that to become an American. And if we can restore that again, of values of history, of legacy, of culture, that's sensitive to the other people's realities, but also can see life in all of us, that we need each other to be in this space in this time today. That's the area that I would foresee as being the, yeah. the hold I would like to see come out of this or the gap to be filled. Great, thank you. Thank you for that, Michael. Um, and I'm just gonna have one, um, one question. This one um, deals with transportation a little bit, but I think it's so much more because it's talking about how do we get residents to have access to services um, so the question was um, by Bakora, um, and you can unmute if you'd like, if you want to expand on this, Bakora. Um, many systems are able to deny residents public transportation, which in terms prevents them from having access to quality food and Medicare. Um, how can we address this? Chesterfield is one of these areas. And, um, you know, there, there are many different solutions to that in, in terms of um, in not only increasing um, their transportation options, but um, um, you know, it, it, it's it, it's it's working to make sure that our local farmers um, have the markets in different locations to um, um, get their products to 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 um, the community members. Um, is there anyone here that is working on any outreach um, programs or anything like that? or um, have any um, comments that they'd like to add on to um, that addresses um, Bakura's question in um, how do we um, increase access in, in our communities? Right. The, the city is, is um, basically saying that we, do, we don't want um, public transportation in our, in our city. What it does is um, prevents people of low income from moving in those communities. It's a direct attack. And so when we do find housing in those communities, we don't have access to public transportation that will get us to work, that will get us to um, doctor's appointments, that will get us to, you know, farmer's markets or grocery stores that provide healthy foods. And so it's like a, a mechanism that's put in place to keep certain people out of these communities. And I'm really concerned about that. Well, Liam, do you want to address that question? Can you, can you repeat the question? It went off for a little bit. I'll let you repeat it before. Okay, so the question is, how do we address the issue of localities being able to determine if they want public transportation in their communities, such as Chesterfield, where I live. There's no public transportation in Chesterfield. It's humongous. And so we have a small demographic of people that do not have access to, um, uh, you know, whether it be doctor's appointments, um, work, being able to get to and from work or grocery stores, they have to either have a car or have somebody to take them when public transportation would be a viable option, especially in a county that is so humongous. Um, so how do we approach that legislatively to say, hey, well, maybe we shouldn't allow localities to be able to make that decision or what other processes can we use to prevent that? I think the first aspect is recognizing the role of local governments in some of the permitting decisions. Um, let, me, let me caveat this and say transit is not my specialty. Let me start there. But I think there's a duality in saying that, you know, recognizing the role of local um, 
jurisdictions and some of the, the, the regional planning issues is important. Um, and so getting individuals to show up to those meetings that are happening where these conversations are being discussed um, is a critical aspect so that we increase the knowledge bank of the surrounding community, right, where these projects are being proposed. I think the second aspect more broadly is that we have to identify sometimes the, 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 the power players who oftentimes stand in the way of some of these projects, right? You know, I think, you know, speaking of experience here in Durham, uh, North Carolina, for example, we were looking at um, the viability of a light rail that would connect the area known as the triangle. So going from Raleigh, Durham to, to, to Chapel Hill, uh, there were uh, instances where the communities were on board, um, where plans were put in place um, and construction was set to start and a number of local power players in the area just, just undercut the entire project. Um, so I think we have to be careful to know where some of those powers exist and be willing to challenge them you know, as, as, as these conversations come up as well. Great, thank you, William. Um, I think with that, we're going to um, transition over to our um, our next session, we are out of time for this, for, for our panel discussion. So um, I am going to continue to look through the chat and ask our, our panelists to help address some of these questions here tonight. Or we, and if we don't get to it tonight, we'll definitely um, um, produce a document and, and put it either on our Facebook or web or webpage at a later time, or we might be able to get to it um, later today. I mean, later on in this um, session. So with that, I would like to thank Kendall, Michael, William, and Weston for, um, for being with us here today and for engaging us in such an informative and inspiring conversation about um, what the Green New Deal Virginia can accomplish if we all work together and to highlight some of the, not only some of the issues that we're facing, but to give us um, a hope and faith that we can continue to move on um, and, 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 and build a better community together, um, particularly during these dark times. So um, thank you. And I hope that you stay with us for the rest of the program and join us in our breakout rooms. Um, and with that, I'd like to turn the program over to uh, Lee Williams, who is going to take us through the second part of our program. Lee? Hey everybody, uh, hope you all are hanging in there. We're rolling to our second hour. I'm gonna start off with um, just a little bit of a retrospective about uh, what Green New Deal, um, how we um, evolved to what we are today. So back in April of um, April 27th in, of 2019, we had our very first summit. And out of that summit came five themes. And the first theme was a just and equitable 100% renewables plan that leaves no workers or communities behind. Theme number two was a clean air, clean water and clean land for all Virginians. Theme three is large investments in job training programs in renewables, building an energy efficient smart grid, residential and commercial energy efficiency. Theme four is investments in local scale agriculture in communities across Virginia. And our fifth theme is prioritize equitable, affordable and clean transportation systems. So that came out of our summit. We had over uh, 70 folks show up to Richmond, Virginia that day, spent eight hours and we um, created eight working groups who then went back and started looking at what policies meant the most to their particular group. So after we got everybody out of their silos and um, invited them to join a coalition, we then threw them all back into their silos so they could work on their particular issues. Uh, by the end of August, they brought forth 50 pieces of legislation. We slapped them all into a Google form and our, our coalition uh, voted on the top, well, we ranked choice voted on all of our policies that were presented by our working groups. And we came up with a top 10 to 15 and then looked at the ones that we could do in Virginia. Some um, like universal healthcare was a federal issue, so we couldn't do that one, but that was in the top 15. Um, we, and then we looked at um, the policies that could fit into our themes. And the top nine policy, or the, we had top 10 policies, the 10th one isn't on this list. Uh, the number one was declare climate emergency. 
Uh, number two actually was the moratorium on any new on any new fossil fuel projects and mandatory renewable portfolio standards. Uh, the second one was incentivize land, soil, health, and carbon sequestration, repeal right to work, required uh, folks to dominion, uh, I don't know if it was dominion was in there, but dominion to um, invest in small scale. Um, and I have a chat in front of my screen, so I can't read it anymore, but you can read number four. Number five is increase minimum wage to a living wage. Six is diversify rural economies and reverse monopolization. Our seventh was protect agricultural land and neighbors. The eighth was promote cleaner fuels and advance electric vehicles. And our ninth was transit oriented development. So we um, were able to um, run with um, those nine policies moving forward. Uh, Delegate Elizabeth Gosmo, uh, uh, Guzman uh, took care of the declare a climate emergency. She made that a, um, a joint resolution, uh, so we didn't have to work on that one. Um, but the others, we uh, worked with uh, Delegate Sam Razul, Delegate Mark Keem, uh, Delegate Kay Corey, Delegate Elizabeth Guzman, and uh, Delegate Lee Carter uh, to carry the weight of the others. Can I have the next slide, please? And you see how we fit our legislation and our legislative priorities um, and, and married it to actual legislation. So I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on here. This video um, is recorded and we will share this. You can take a screenshot of this, but you can see how we matched our policies, um, our policy priorities with legislation to match our themes. And next slide, please. I'm about to release you all into your working groups, your breakout sessions. I'm really excited about this. This is the uh, heart of Green New Deal. This is the collaboration of all of our voices coming together to talk about uh, policies that will impact all of us. And um, we are fortunate enough to be joined in some of our working groups by our Green New Deal champions. Uh, Delegate Mark Keem is gonna be joining the Sustainable uh, sorry, the uh, Social Justice and um, Health Disparities Group. Delegate Sam Razul is going to do a twofer. He's going to start off in our Food and Agriculture Group and then head over to the Defossilization, Energy Efficiency and Renewables Group. Delegate Elizabeth Guzman is going to be in our Sustainable Cities and Transportation Group. And of course, our Delegate Lee Carter, our champion of workers' rights, is going to be over in our Sustainable Jobs talking about um, what transpired at the General Assembly last year with his repeal right to work bill. Welcome back to the summit. This is Lee Williams, co-director of Green New Deal Virginia. Thank you for your patience and grace as we navigated the intricacies of that breakout session. Unfortunately, current Zoom technologies do not allow us to record our individual breakout sessions. So we had members from our outreach and education working groups take detailed notes for our session leaders. We will be hearing from them a little later during the report back portion of tonight's summit. We've taken two hours of your time this evening. So before we hear the report back, let me introduce Stair Calhoun from coalition partner Network Nova. Stair will lead us all in a little self-care with an energizing stretch before the report back session. If you're sitting, stand up. If you're standing, sit down. And interlace your fingers and press your palms up. And breathe the air. Root your feet down. Maybe Pop up onto your toes a little bit and then descend down through your heels. Really inhale up into your arms and exhale, ground down. So draw your quadriceps up, press your palms firmly up, breathe and hold here. So let's breathe and hold here for a moment and let's close our eyes. So you can just let your breath go a little bit here and just feel where you are here in space with your group. So crazy. Just feel what's going on. Press up your hands with your inhale breath. Draw your quadriceps up. 
And exhale, bring your arms to cactus pose. So breathe here. Again, just feel yourself standing here, being part of this, which we are now, this virtual space, which I've been enjoying for the last two months. <laughs> and just try to feel what's going on here in your own space here and in your virtual space. It was fun for me to see people that I know on the call tonight and know that we're working for common purpose. So take an inhale here and exhale, drive your elbows down your back. Inhale, let your arms float up and exhale, send your arms down. Inhale, let your arms come up, and exhale, bring your arms together. Let your elbows touch, let your palms touch, press firmly, and inhale, open your arms. And exhale. I don't think I could do that. <laughs> and again, inhale. And exhale, close it up. Hold it tight, inhale here, and extend the arms out. Exhale, bend the elbows and bring the fingertips to the shoulders. Inhale, stretch the arms up. Feel the legs strong. Go back to the feet. Exhale, fingertips to the shoulders. Inhale, take your arms up. And exhale, take your arms down. So as we stand here in Samastidihi, Tadasana, Equally balanced pose. Just send some energy down through your fingertips. Roll your shoulders up back and down. Level your chins. Just be here present in a standing position. Close your eyes if you like. Feel your surroundings. I'll take my cue from when they're ready to resume and we've got our breakout rooms ready. So let's take our arms up and down with the inhale. Interlace our fingers, press them up. Inhale here. And exhale, tilt back a bit. Open your chest. Let your chin go up to the ceiling. And then inhale, come back again. Inhale, reach up. And over. Exhale, come back to starting. And inhale once again, out and over. And exhale, come back to starting. Inhale, press up. Chin's level. And exhale. Bring your arms down there and release your fingers behind your back. Inhale, press your arms back. Breathe here. So press your arms back. Interlace fingers, press them back. Chin level, belly strong, quadriceps engaged. Inhale, exhale, fall forward. So rooting down through the feet, drawing up through the quadriceps, lengthening the spine, letting the arms go up and over. So really get into the feet. Many of you are probably wearing shoes. Feel your feet. Inhale, bring it up. Exhale, release. Inhale, put your hands to your waist. Exhale, twist around to the left. So as you twist around to the left, bring your right hip back and then twist it down. Breathe and hold, drop your shoulders down your back. Look well over your left shoulder or the shoulder that's in back of you, whichever way you turn. Take an inhale and look towards your front shoulder. Exhale, hold. Inhale here. And exhale, let's spin around to the other side. So level the hips. Keep the left hip back. This is for, I'm twisting now to my left. So keep the left hip back. I'm twisting around to my right. So keep your left hip back. Okay, so opposite hip, opposite leg, back leg, back hip, twist. Drop the shoulders down the back, draw the quadriceps up. Lengthen, look well over your shoulder. 
Take an inhale and look over your front shoulder. Exhale, hold. Inhale here. And exhale, release, interlace your fingers. Inhale, press up. Exhale, hold. Inhale, come up on your toes. Exhale, root and hold. So come up on your toes. Energize here. Level your chins. Find your balance. Inhale. And exhale, bring it down. Transfer your weight onto your left leg. Find a dristy. This is a visual focal point off the tip of your nose. Go ahead and eat your food, but don't be looking for something for that. Bring your right knee up into your chest. All right. Feel your balance here. Not working so well for me today. Get strong in the left leg. Right knee comes up. Plant your foot on the inside of your thigh. Press your foot firmly into your leg, and your leg firmly into your thigh. This is my bad side, so. Strong. Quads lifted. Shift the weight. Leg comes up. So once you get the foot pressing into the leg and the leg pressing back into the foot, you usually can find a nice solid balance here. Try a few more breaths on this side. And let's switch to the other side. Okay, so strong legs, quads lifted, bellies in, glutes squeezed. Bring up the left knee. Feel the strain from the standing leg. And bring the foot inside the thigh. Press the foot firmly. The thigh drives back into the foot. Breathe and hold. Not working well for me today. Inhale, exhale, release. Let's try this. Inhale, arms up. Exhale, bring your right knee into your chest. Inhale, arms up. Exhale, bring your left knee into your chest. Inhale, arms up. Exhale, right knee. Inhale, arms up. Exhale, left knee. Inhale, arms up. Exhale, release. How are we doing? Right. Well, that was fast. How'd everybody do? Would we like to go in any particular order? I think I um, on our sheet we have... Um, Stacey Lovelace's group, Defossilization, Energy Efficiency, Renewables. Um, would you be able to report out from your um, working group? Yeah, um, so I'm the one who took notes, so I'll report back. Um, Introduce yourself, Jolene. Oh, yes. I'm Jolene Wapness. I'm with uh, Food and Water Action. I'm their Virginia organizer. Um, yeah, so that's me. And we are the Defossilization Energy Efficiency and Renewable Group. Um, I guess what we went over was kind of our main policy platform for the upcoming year. Um, so the first and foremost of our goals, um, and these are goals that we explained um, that were voted on by the coalition from the onset and we're just honoring those goals this year. Um, so one of them is a moratorium and all new fossil fuel projects because cutting the supply off prevents, you know, locking Virginia into decades more of fossil fuel infrastructure. Um, the second goal we're really focusing on is a renewable portfolio standard that meets the facts of climate change and doing this in a way where um, we transition to only 100% clean, renewable, safe energy um, while also bolstering community, vulnerable communities and workers along the way. 
um, that's when we had Delegate Razul join us and he kind of had a panel a little bit um, with our attendees. Um, he went over about the work we have to do after passing the VCEA. Um, he mentioned that the VCEA did start some conversations. However, it did it, it passed these types of standards and provisions on the backs of ratepayers and vulnerable communities um, and pushing them, pushing this just transition out of the way. And because of that, he said, any environmental policy we go forth has to have environmental justice and like social and economic justice as its center front, as the center of it. Otherwise it's not worth it. Um, so that was kind of the summary of his message going forth. Um, another goal that we wanted to talk about was climate action plan, which, which goes with what Razul um, mentioned was kind of one of the key things he wants to focus on with our policies is that we want the climate action plan to be this all encompassing holistic way of tackling climate change um, that has a special emphasis on social justice and ratepayers so that this transition as well as other aspects of kind of getting to combat the climate change crisis, not just the energy sector, but the agricultural sector is all done intentionally with a separate own department, own way of um, experts on the side, constantly looking at this issue. And then our fourth goal is energy efficiency mandates that requires energy consumption by at least 2.4% annually with an emphasis on weatherizing buildings um, and upscaling or hold on, sorry, my notes are done vertically or horizontally um, with an emphasis on weatherizing buildings, upgrading and modernizing heating and cooling and lighting and forbidding gas use um, and requiring rooftop solar. So that's kind of all of our goals. We're doing a two pronged approach. So we're having an omnibus bill similar to the Green New Deal Act. But we're also gonna take parts of the Green New Deal Act that our group felt um, should be really prioritized into separate bills like the fossil fuel moratorium so that those types of pieces, if the omnibus bill for some reason does not get through as much as we wanted to, perhaps the other pieces would. Um, so we don't lose all of the bill, if that makes sense. So yeah, we have, I'll put into the chat um, the document Stacy created in case anyone else wants to advocate for these goals. We had a document of kind of next steps you can do. Um, you can join our group. Um, what majority of our group will be kind of fine tuning the goals that I laid out. Um, but if you are unable to commit to that, feel free to follow the advocacy, advocacy steps we laid out in that form that I put in the chat. Great, thank you so much, Jolene. Next up is Sustainable Cities and Transportation. Um, our facilitator group leader is Gary Harris and Delegate Elizabeth Guzman was in that room. And our liaison there is Aisha Kozad. Hi everyone. Gary went on and talked with the delegates, asked them to share some information, um, talking with Delegate Keem about making sure, how do we make sure that sustainable and clean transportation is equitable for everyone. Um, and Delegate Keem talked about ensuring that all people need to have financial, economic, and political incentives to make it work. Um, they talked a little bit about gaps, um, and how do we uh, address that issue? Um, and Adelia Keem talked about people's feelings that their issues were the most important and most urgent, um, and that we have to build coalitions to address everyone's issues and sort of be respectful of that felt urgency. Uh, Delegate Guzman talked a little bit about the lessons that she's learned um, about how to successfully advance legislation. We all know she had a great win um, and um, how to deal with opposition that she experienced. Um, Gary talked, uh, asked Delegate Guzman about uh, any feedback now that the bill is signed um, and Delegate Guzman shared um, that she's very excited that some localities have reached out to help as they begin implementation um, and that it's exciting for her to be on the implementation side of the whole legislative process. Um, so we had folks come in, we did some introductions, people shared um, sort of where they're at, uh, looking at issues of transportation and sustainable cities. Um, 
a few questions that were sort of hyper local. Um, and then at the end, because we unfortunately we just didn't have a lot of time, Gary asked everyone to share their transportation passion and what policies do they want to see developed. Um, and that list um, looked at supportive land use and smart scaling, looking at using leftover COVID federal funds to make smart, sustainable purchases like electric buses increasing more public transportation, um, looking for something big and exciting in the world of biking, walking, and trails, um, looking for some type of incentive that might encourage um, localities, perhaps state matching funds, um, promoting the idea of zero fare transit. Um, and that was pretty much our time. You made great use of your limited time, Aisha. Thank you, Aisha and Gary, um, for that great report back. Um, could we go next to the Financing the Green New Deal with facilitators Mike Grimm and Mark Armstrong, and their liaison was Bobby Moncella. Um, so we didn't have a whole lot of time in the room, unfortunately, so we skimmed over, um, you know, and it ties into the Deer Group uh, sort of uh, focus, but you know, why are we trying to pursue this renewable portfolio standard, 100% renewable portfolio standard? Um, you know, what's possible? Is it, is it really uh, possible to achieve a 100% renewable electricity grid? Uh, the answer to that is clearly yes. Uh, Virginia has more than sufficient renewable energy resource to accomplish that. We gave an example of what a potential energy mix would look like um, that would provide good stability uh, using local resource. Um, and then we went into the cost and some of the mechanisms that are available to pay for it, uh, whether that being the government, uh, whether it be uh, public banking, um, you know, independent power producers or uh, allowing communities and individuals to uh, finance it themselves. Um, and then we went into a couple of case studies uh, as to, um, you know, examples out there of how these projects have been financed um, and some of the banking, public banking uh, options. So, for example, the Bank of North Dakota um, and what's ha been happening um, in uh, New York as well. Um, and unfortunately, we ran out of time. That sounds like you accomplished a lot, though, um, considering uh, the time constraints. Thank you so much for that. Um, I'm hoping you were able to uh, gather some more folks to your um, working group and they'll be meeting soon, but we'll hear about that hopefully at the at the end. Um, thank you guys. I appreciate it. Um, let's move to a more democratic governance with facilitators Glenn Bessa and Shelley Tamris and their liaison is William Spencer. Okay, this is Glenn. Um, we acknowledged uh, a lot of success last year in terms of bills that opened a uh, more rights for voters, uh, less stringent uh, issues relative to voter identification, uh, a longer polling hours, uh, most important, no excuse absentee voting. Uh, at the same time, though, there were a lot of questions about the need for vote by mail, particularly this year with COVID-19. And we felt there was a need to communicate with the governor and the state board of elections to determine whether or not that is something that we can get done this year. There are some practical applications with regard to moving something that complicated forward, but we felt uh, a real need to push for that immediately, uh, particularly with a special session coming up. Um, uh, a number of other reforms related to electric co-ops were, were discussed as well, uh, but some new issues that uh, uh, were brought up as well, I just want to acknowledge was uh, the concept of uh, community rights uh, and the rights of nature, a, a concept that's emerging with regard to investing legal rights in things like lakes and rivers and such so that, uh, uh, that we can challenge pipelines beyond just uh, the neighbors nearby. Um, also, um, uh, discussions in support again of the public bank, which is something South Dakota has. Um, and uh, uh, I guess I'll stop right there and see if there's anything else that uh, uh, obviously we're talking about. We, we did mention uh, the redistricting reform 
issue that will be on the ballot this year and would urge support for that. Um, and I know we'll be having some subsequent calls with Andrea Miller as our chair to, to set some priorities. That's great. Outstanding. Thank you so much. Um, next up, um, if we could hear from the local food and agriculture group and have sustainable jobs on deck. Um, the facilitator of the local food and agriculture group is Anthony Flacavento and uh, Delegate Sam Razul was in that group as well and their liaison was Madeline Kelsey and I know we kept her in the main room for a very long time so I guess Anthony's doing all the talking. Yeah that's not hard for me Lee. Mm -hmm. um, thank you all. So we also of course have very limited time and we reviewed the policy priorities that we had come up with over 2019 going into the 2020 session. Uh, three, they were threefold. One was the local food and farming infrastructure bill, which got 99% of the way towards being passed. And as Delegate Rasool explained, after passing the strong bipartisan support in both chambers, it got nixed basically um, as payback to him for a vote that Democratic leadership did not like on another unrelated bill, but it is our priority going forward for the 2021 session um, and a priority to also put more money behind it than was contained in the original bill, if at all possible. The other two priorities were around economic diversification, which is a little bit down the road, and soil health and carbon sequestration, which we hope to work up support for by the 2022 session. We put out a plea for more people, and I think we may get some, I hope, because the three of us who've been kind of carrying the ball don't have a whole lot of time. And the only other thing I'll mention, two comments literally in the last 30 seconds of our session about other priorities people would like to see addressed. One was uh, some focus on how do we create more access to healthy local food especially in uh, communities that don't have ready access. And related to that, uh, Michael mentioned the critical need for nutrition education so that people uh, not only have food access when you create that, but also have the knowledge and skills um, and interest to be able to, to cook and to utilize healthy food. So those were, would both be new dimensions for the Food and Farm Group, which if we can get enough new members, uh, we might be able to take on. Thanks. Great. Thanks very much. Uh, next up, we have sustainable jobs. Matt Royer and Greg Ackerman. And I know there were some shenanigans with getting you into that group. Hope you uh, were able to have a good meeting. We were. Thank you. Um, Natalie, did you want to go over what we talked about? Um, you can go ahead. <laughs> 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 Thank right. you. Yeah. No, it's uh, just notes, but yeah, go no, ahead. Good. Um, yeah, so uh, yeah, we had a great conversation about not, um, and, and you know, Delegate Carter brought up a good point in that it's not just talking about jobs for sustainability, but talking about sustainability within those jobs as well. Um, you know, one of the things that we talked about was with some of these developers when it comes to renewable energy. Um, what they'll do is bring on contractors for a, a like small amount of time and then uh, cut them loose after the project has been done. So one of the things that we're trying to be, uh, you know, cognizant about is uh, making sure that when we're talking about the jobs we are developing within renewable energy and, and within um, the Commonwealth in, in general, we're coming up with ways that those folks will continue to see work down the line no matter what. Um, and one of those ways is obviously bringing in the unions um, to help uh, the workforce development there through trainings, through education for those jobs. And then also making sure that those workers have the, um, the uh, bargaining power that they should need when they're negotiating contracts for further work. Uh, one of the things that Greg also brought up, um, which is obviously uh, making sure that we're bringing in uh, project labor agreements for all of these work, um, these works as well, um, and uh, making sure that those uh, agreements are carrying over um, when it comes to you know workplace uh, safety um, and also uh, you know 
uh, workers, uh, just workers' rights in general. Um, we also discussed, you know, uh, the biggest issue with some other folks in opposition is they talk about how, you know, some of these workers in fossil fuel industries will lose their jobs if we talk about eliminating them. And, you know, one of the, a couple things we discussed was making sure that those trainings are available to those workers um, through the unions after they are um, sort of weaned off the, uh, the fossil fuel jobs. And then also uh, making sure that uh, there's similar legislation on board that is like uh, New York State's legislation that talks about setting money aside to pay those workers when um, they're out of work and they're transitioning from industry to industry. Um, so, you know, it was overall a great discussion. Um, very uh, excited to see, you know, talk, um, we talked a lot about the, the coalition building we'll be needing to do th between environmental activists, labor activists, the unions, and um, green energy developers, um, making sure that we're having all of this discussions together so that we can continue um, to build upon the economic justice portion of the Green New Deal. So uh, I am very excited to hear all the ideas that were kicked around and uh, very much looking forward to uh, working with everybody and uh, making sure that we're getting those workers the, the sustainable jobs that they need, um, as was mentioned. Yeah, get our economy revving again. Thank you so much, Matt, appreciate it. Um, and last but not least, we have social justice and health disparities and uh, that working group is led by Bakora Shabazz. This is um, Kendall. I don't mind um, trying to at least throw <laughs> throw a few a few cents in. Um, so I, I I feel like we're one of the groups that you know as soon as time was over we got really we really started having a good conversation. Um, but just kind of quickly recapping a lot of what we were talking about was in response to um, the COVID crisis. Um, so we were um, discussing, you know, ensuring that, you know, folks have access to utilities. Um, so, you know, obviously water, power, um, internet. Um, we talked about, um, obviously, healthcare coverage, uh, making sure that, you know, everyone has access to that. Uh, we also um, thought a little bit about, um, you know, thinking about how Dominion plays into this um, in terms of, potentially getting refunds from some of their overcharges. Um, and, and also um, uh, folks mentioned um, Delegate Jay Jones's um, bill that would have reduced um, lowered energy bills um, across the Commonwealth. Um, and then the last thing that I remember is um, uh, also trying to expand the Environmental Justice Act um, because there were some pieces that didn't quite get through um, this year mm -hmm. that really pertain to the responsibilities of state agencies. Um, and if there are any other folks on the social justice team that want to weigh in, please do so. Molly, do you want to add anything to that report? Um, I, I think Kendall covered it very well. Um, unfortunately, Bakura, the group leads connection was poor, so we only had her with us for about 10 minutes, but um, she was asking how can we impact the most change in Virginia, um, just like Kendall was saying um, about utilities. Um, there was a comment made that Virginia doesn't have the best system of public transportation, especially in Richmond, and should we have more transportation systems and perhaps move toward electric. Um, and Delegate Keem did talk about the um, legislation which passed and um, will become law on uh, July 1st, but then he emphasized that uh, laws have to be exercised in order to be real, and laws are only as powerful as the citizens that take action to implement them on a daily basis. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's pretty much where we left it. Great. Well, you were the last group, so I'm going to ask you some questions first. Um, were you able to gather any more um, folks willing to join the group? So I would have to throw that back to Kendall or Kate or someone who was involved um, last year. Okay. Um, we didn't get to that question, but we would love more help. So if you're interested, please contact Bakura or you can send me or Podi a message in the group chat right now. 
and we will make sure that you are added to the awesome social justice and health disparities group. Because it is going places this year. <laughs> Thank you so much, Kendall. Yeah, and I'm sorry I dropped out again because uh, uh, another call I'm on just got controversial exactly at this time. But I would hope that everybody would join this group because it really is such an important group. Uh, because if the New Deal is going to be implemented again, we can't reinvent the institutionalization of pre-existing inequities that happened the last time there was a big federal mobilization and it got uh, hamstrung both at the federal and state level. Yeah. Hi, this is Karen. Um, on the call, um, Bacora did mention she will be sending out a doodle poll. Um, she's looking, um, she's trying to figure out what date and time. So um, definitely like what Kendall said, reach out and get your email to Bacora so you can be added to that doodle poll. Um, and then there will be regular meetings with the social justice and health disparities group moving forward. Great. Karen, were there any other questions in the chat? for the social justice and health disparities group? There is, um, Kay had mentioned that there is a petition about no utility shutoffs through the um, pandemic. And she, um, she added the link into the chat. So if any, everybody who, if you have not signed this petition yet, please do so. Um, it's very crucial to try and keep utilities um, ongoing, even in times of, particularly during times of crisis. Um, and that is it that I see in like, for social justice. I have two questions. Um, one's for the food and agriculture group, specifically Michael Carter. Two questions came up and um, folks were wondering, how do we find small farmers to support? Is there a network um, list of them somewhere? Um, do you find them at farmers markets? Um, what's the best way to support your local farmer? Hey, I might just take, um, I'm not in the agriculture group, but buylocalvirginia.org is a great way to find farmers. Um, they have chapters throughout the state, buylocalvirginia.org, farmers who sell directly to consumers. Like CSAs? CSAs, absolutely. Uh, and then I had a, cre a question for the jobs group. Matt, um, when you were talking about training, um, is that training specifically by the unions for the union apprentices, or are you talking about training partnerships with the state or in localities? How do you all envision the training you are talking about? Okay, this is Natalie. I can remember what the discussion was. Um, and the ultimate, the um, ideal is to have the job training program sponsored through the unions so that you know union jobs will be um, available afterwards. Um, but the problem happens is when some companies or developers will come in and promise workers training, um, but then you know when they're done with the job, you know, the worker has lost a job. So there isn't this, this idea of sustainable, not just sustainable um, uh, work, but sustainable jobs that will keep people employed in the long run. Um, so I think that was the intent for the training program to be under the union umbrella. Great. Thank you for, to clar for clarifying that for me, Natalie. I appreciate it. Sure. Are there any other questions for any of our working groups? Um, I think it's safe to just unmute yourself and ask at them at this point. Hey, are you coming? Yeah. Hey, this is Glenn. I just wanted to reemphasize what we was raised in our issue with regard to vote by mail and how critical that is this year and whether Green New Deal can send, and we have some legislators on the call too, could send a letter to the Board of uh, Elections as well as the governor uh, if there's a special session and determine whether or not we can appropriate the funds necessary and whether it's physically possible to actually get that done. Because obviously uh, we could see an outbreak again this fall and even uh, in the current situation, uh, voting in person could be extremely hazardous to folks' health. What is the, uh, the date, the cutoff for that right now? Do you know, Glenn? I'm sure you do. Uh, there is no particular cutoff. Uh, there's no right uh, you don't have to apply to no, vote. 45 days before the election. So I think 45 days before November 3rd would be 
the typical date for following absentee. So they'd have to get the mechanisms in place to do that. Uh, typically, they send out a note to everyone or they send a ballot out. So in states that do it, I think there, there are serious questions as to whether it could logistically be done. But until somebody takes a look at it, we don't know. Can I interject? Um, I grew up in Oregon and we've been doing it for 20 years and it works great. So look at Oregon if you're looking for a model. Right. I think I heard the Oregon uh, Board of Elections director say that it took them several years to set up. So uh, they, yeah, they love it, but it, it's not something you click your fingers and do. So, but hopefully we can. So we should uh, explore with the State Board of Elections and the governor as to whether we can get it done. It definitely is the way we should go. We all think we should do a, a, a sign-on letter or um, like an action network uh, petition. We can discuss that with you. There was a thought that we ought to do some kind of alert more broadly, but uh, there was also the possibility of Green New Deal, Virginia sending out a letter to the governor and the Board of Elections asking uh, that they, they do this. this is our there's, there's no one way to get this done, I think. All right, thanks for that. Before, before we move on to the next question, I just wanted to, um, there were some comments in here. Um, will um, the Food and Agriculture Group be meeting on a regular basis or will be meeting again? Um, and there's some interest for other groups. Um, definitely, if you are interested in con continuing the conversation with any of the groups, whether you were a part of it tonight or you're interested in or, or you didn't get into your group, um, please put your name and your email address along with the group that you'd like to join in the chat box. And we will make sure that the working group leaders um, are, um, get it and you are added to their meeting um, invitations. And then there's a, a notice that the local food hub in um, Charlottesville is um, published, uh, Piedmont Environmental Council uh, publishes um, a by local guard uh, a guide, kind of uh, Nova centered. So if somebody's looking for ideas on how to get to local markets, that is a really great resource, um, the local food hub. Um, and then uh, Kay was reminding everybody to register to vote <laughs> and sign up for absentee ballot. And she's got um, links for um, for you to register for your Virginia absentee ballot in the chat box. Nice time to help out the post office, exactly right. Um, do food banks have a working association with small farmers so that their crops will be um, used, put to good use for supplying food banks? The local food hub here in Charlottesville has that relationship. So there are places throughout. Okay. Um, we can definitely try and, and find out some more information. Uh, what's the name of your local food hub that you have, Kay? Uh, local food hub. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> the one I just read. Um, let's see. Ah, somebody said the, there was a campaign that sent out 50,000 absentee ballot applications, so they're on it. Do you want to open the mic again? Um, let me go further up and see if we have any hey, questions. Uh, Karen, I just wanted to distinguish between absentee ballot applications and um, actually mailing out absentee ballots. Yes, thank you. We want to fund, by law, the ballots have to be finalized uh, 60 days prior and then you have to have access to them 45 days prior. And so we could do this in a special session and authorize the funding. And what we really wanna do is to ensure that we mail an actual ballot for people to complete, at least if we do it temporarily for this November election. So I know a number of us are going to be pushing for, for that. Already. Great, we're halfway there then. Karen, anything else from the chat box? Any could, I or comment? Rousseau, could I ask Delegate Rousseau if he's talked with the State Board of Elections or the governor about this? Because I know it's uh, a lot of money and it's also complicated uh, logistically. I'm just curious to know whether they're taking a hard look at the feasibility of getting this done, uh, Delegate Rousseau. 
Yeah, and in the conversations that we've had through the Secretary of the Administration, who the Department of Elections falls under, um, they're looking at a number of, of different options. And in part, um, you know, certainly the, uh, the, the data that they're looking at around uh, the coronavirus and the various phases that we're entering in, um, uh, do, do they feel uh, we'll be able to safely administer the uh, the election. The problem at hand is, isn't whether or not we think we can safely administer an election. The problem is, is are the people going to be confident uh, in wanting to come to the poll to vote? And uh, voter confidence is different from uh, what our capabilities are. So that's the, the distinction that we're trying to make internally. And I know we will have a number of additional conversations, this clearly will be a, um, a, a topic that will come up in the special session later this summer. And for Mark Keem, yes, this is the star of Rona behind me in a couple spots. So. <laughs> Great. I don't have any additional questions. We're getting a lot of requests to join groups, which is fantastic. Um, thank you, Delegate I, Razul, for um, clarifying that with us. Um, are we good to move on, do you think, Karen? It's got a question. Oh, hi. Yeah. Sorry. Oh. I was using the um, raise my hand icon over there on the participants tab, but I know you all have tons of participants, so I'm not going to e scroll through it. Um, I, I'm doing work for Center for Common Ground. We make calls to different states that are, you know, their primaries are coming up and we get them to be registered vote. We also remind them to the changes their state and the hijinks that their state, especially Georgia, is one of the states we're focusing on. But one thing I noticed, the way Georgia, when they send the ballot, they do the um, request form first. You have to ask for your ballot and then you get your ballot, you possibly get your ballot. But um, I think what I've come across when I talk to these callers, they're confused or they feel talked down to because they think that the request form is their ballot when it in fact is not. So you'll have people wait till the last moment. It might just assume that request form's a ballot and they're like, well, I can always take this in early voting or I could just take it in on election day and then they miss their opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, that's what I'm worried because if we're going to go to mail by vote um, process, I think we should just send the ballot, not a request form. I know there'll probably be pushback mm -hmm. um, in the special session for that, but that's what I would recommend, like my experience making those calls. Are you familiar with how they do it in Oregon? Because we were su it was suggested yeah. that we look at their model. Yeah, yeah. You just get a you everyone get everyone who's registered to vote gets their ballot in the mail and they can drop it off at any like public, at, there's, drop boxes, there's drop boxes at every public building or they can mail it in and they get two envelopes in with their ballot. So there's like a ballot, an envelope that they sign on the outside and then there's a secrecy envelope inside that contains the ballot. Well, my concern for the drop off locations is some of them are not monitored. They, they say they put them in like a campus and people just, drop their ballot, walk away. I mean, I think we would need ballot boxes that are locked and adhere to the ground. That's well, how I would feel safe yeah, if we had I mean, a dropout center. Yeah, oh. they're basically like mailboxes. They're like permanent fixtures at like every library and That um, would be good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, I mean, it would take some doing, but yeah. How much pushback do you think we'll have though with other parties? for getting a mail by vote or a drop off location. You think it's possible that we can do the mail in election? If Oregon can do it, we can do it. You think it will be able to get other people to uh, vote in favor of that? That's our job. How, oh good, because like how close are we, how far apart from the election do we have to be in order to make this change? Was my other concern. I think that this is actually uh, one of the questions is logistically whether it can be done. I, in listening to someone, I think they interviewed from Oregon, who's in charge of this, they they raised uh, logistical issues with regards to just the uh, physical ability to mail these out and then process them when they come back in. Because when you're talking about receiving millions of ballots back in return in envelopes, 
uh, that's no small task in terms of processing them. So, so hopefully it could be done and uh, there may be vendors that can help get that done. I know that uh, some places in these primaries, there were some vendors that were criticized for not doing a very good job of getting the ballots out. So, so uh, definitely should be done. I guess there's questions as to the cost and the commitment and the logistics of getting it done in a short time frame we have. I, I don't know the answer to that, but we should definitely look into it and try and get it done. Would there be any legal challenges if we did push for this? It's gonna require- the Other the sides, point. other parties? Same with Sewell mentioned- But they halt it, it right. the change? Sam Rasool mentioned he's gonna put in legislation. It would require, it, it, I suspect it would require legislation because it's gonna require a lot of money too. So yeah. require an appropriation. Yeah, it's, it's actually oh. very, very interesting um, that uh, folks who are tend to be more vulnerable with regards to coronavirus uh, tend to be in an older demographic, and those folks tend to vote more um, uh, Republican. And um, as you know, Republicans are not known for uh, expanding the voting electorate. Um, you, this may be something that has potentially some, some bipartisan support. I, I'm not sure if I'm the one that's going to be, but uh, putting it in, uh, but the, I'm sure members of the majority uh, will be, will we'll have those internal conversations. Hopefully, because I was hearing about the Supreme Court case. Um, they were trying to, I think the Republican party of California was challenging the uh, mail by vote, you know, ballots, the mail-in ballots. So, but, and they also, they put their reason that it was too close to the election time in order to change it. And I think this was for their primary, but I'm worried about challenges like that getting in the way. Yeah, a lot to think about. Well, thank you for your questions and comments. Are there any more before we move on? I don't want to cut anybody off. All right, I hate to take Silence as approval. <laughs> Anybody else? All right, going once, going twice. All right, we are going to move on uh, to our thank yous and our next steps. So thank you, thank you, thank you for bearing with us as we dealt with our technical glitches. Um, and I hope you can forget them when you think back to our fabulous opening um, with our keynote speaker, William Barber III. Uh, followed by Kendall Crawford and Michael Carter and our rock star, Karen Kaplan, co-chair of Green New Deal Virginia. Um, big shout out to the heavy lift that Andrea Miller did with our, as our technical advisor. Uh, she had to uh, vacate our meeting to go to another one. So um, please, if you see her or shoot her a text, um, thank her for the heavy lift she did here in helping us out. Um, thank you to our working group leaders who've been working for the last two and a half months with us. Made uh, quarantine a lot of fun because we had our standing Monday call um, as we thought about you know, our next steps as we we're le uh, leading up to our next summit here. And uh, let's see, uh, that's it for our thank yous. Moving on to our next steps. Please, please, please join a working group. Green New Deal Virginia is a grassroots organization. Grassroots means we need you to come help us. We don't have lawyers, we don't have, unless they volunteer, uh, we don't have a big bureaucracy behind us. Um, we are a frontline led organization and we need your voice. And we recognize these are really difficult times for a lot of people right now. We will make space and allow time for folks to join us because we cannot do this without those frontline voices. So please, if, if, if you can't, um, but you know some of you can, send them our way. Um, our health and um, uh, social justice and health disparities group, our transportation group, our good governance group, they all need you and um, we can't do it without you. So um, go to our website if you need more information. Um, there's a second tab on there that tells you um, next steps and how you can get involved. We have petitions. Um, we are uh, currently gathering signatures for um, a just recovery from the uh, economic and health crisis that's um, embracing Virginia and the, and the country and, and the world. Um, we have resources um, 
they're contacting their legislator over the summer we're asking folks to reach out to their legislators um, now that we're all really good at zoom conferences we can um, have zoom meetings with your legislator so you don't even have to go into their office anymore you can just make an appointment to have a, ch a video chat with them um, you, we need letters to the editor. We need to keep the pressure up. We see how strong our folks are in the streets. The last four days, Richmond is lit. People are, are not taking no for an answer this time. We are standing up and demanding what we need, that real change to address the inequities in our economy and our health care, everything. Everything's on the table this year. This is a huge opportunity to get everything that we want done, done. Um, Email, let's see, Summit will be available on YouTube in a couple days. We are gonna be editing this just a wee bit um, to take out um, the, the uh, dead air that we um, had. Um, also, uh, we will be sending around the, um, the notes. The, the notes. Um, some of our working group leaders had notes in their meeting and we're gonna ask them to share them as well. So you'll see what happened in the other groups. Uh, we are gonna be having a couple uh, virtual movie nights since we'll probably be a little bit uh, still socially isolating over the, over the, win over the summer. Um, we're gonna have a couple movie nights. There's a great agricultural film and uh, one about disruption that we um, are looking at to show and um, look for our policy launch. Our working groups are gonna start tomorrow working on legislation, legislative ideas um, for the up and coming 2021 legislative session. This is gonna be a tough year for us. Last year, we were really lucky. A delegate Sam Razul's office was very generous and helped us draft most of our bills. Um, they had no limit last year on how many bills they could draft. That's not the case this year. This year, each delegate and senator are limited to 25, excuse me, 15? Somebody help me. I'm a little dyslexic. Is it 25 or 15? Uh, 15, 15 is 15 bills. Yeah, so it's even worse. So we can only draft 15 bills per champion. Um, and we don't, we want to make sure that we have strong bills, um, which means we have to meet with stakeholders starting next week. Um, if you know you're going to have a bill that's going to impact the Department of Environmental Quality, we need to make, you know, meetings with uh, Chris Bast and, and, and the, the people who can help us with our policy. So, um, Green New Deal, follow us on uh, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And one more slide. Um, while, you're, while you're switching your slide, Lee, I just wanted to add one teeny tiny thing. Um, so, um, in your working group, you had individuals from our outreach and education working group. We also have that. That group is going to be helping us with our messaging, helping us get our, the word out, helping us design all of our materials and everything like that and doing presentations. So, that is also a working group that we need help on. So, please also consider joining the outreach and education working group. Put your name in and contact information. Um, um, in the chat room and Molly Bacall and Natalie Pian, who are co-chairing this group, will be getting back in touch with you and telling you how you can attend their meetings and become a part of that group. Outstanding. Thank you, Karen. Missed that spot. So in closing, help us build a just recovery movement that looks like all of us. As William Barber III said in the beginning, this is our time. So join Green New Deal Virginia and let's rise together. Thank you all for participating and good night. Good night, everyone. Thanks for joining. Good night. Star for everyone. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.